thank you for the question. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I um, uh, um, so my lab is like uh, how uh, robotics and vision now. I'm from, coming from more from uh, actually a vision background. I do more a lot of vision in my PhD. Um, so today's talk I think is also a little bit late. Um, so I'm going to I think probably start from robotics and then gradually going back <laughs> to vision. Um, so so the, the, the title is is basically generalization for robotics. Um, so I'm firmly believe in a data driven approach um, to to do uh, to do robotics. Um, so uh, and this data driven approach has turned out to be quite um, successful. Like uh, we have very good systems on uh, recognitions, and then we have very good uh, results for um, for basically not working. Uh, right. um, somehow it doesn't work. Um, for, for the language, right? So everyone pays twenty dollars a month. Hopefully, uh, I'm not. I, at least I pay twenty dollars a month to <laughs> to make our lives is uh, much easier. Um, so this kind of uh, data driven approach is kind of uh, very exciting, showing to be uh, working very well. Large scale learning. And then the same efforts has been basically tried to be migrated to um, to robotics as well. So there is some works basically trying to do all this self-supervised training and uh, learning large models and then transfer to robotics tasks. But you can use contrasted learning, MAE, whatever, contrasted learning in time, and then um, make this model and then help robot to do things. And then there's also this RT series of work. Uh, you have RT2, RT8, um, so from Google, so basically, RT2 is the approach, uh, training a big transformer on a lot of data, and then RTX is basically about the data, collect a lot of data from universities and different institutes, and then shows uh, very encouraging results. Um, so let's uh, let's take a little bit the zoom in look of this RTX uh, RT2 approach. So um, if you really look into the task, it's actually performing. Um, we're still using this parallel filter to do some pick and place work. Uh, in most of the time. Um, so for this kind of task, it shows that actually you, you only need the 2D input. So they are training a big VIP and transformers on top of these 2D observations. Um, so, so I would think that uh, currently, at least the task they define and they, they try to might, uh, try to apply on uh, is still relatively simple and then it does not need a lot of 3D understanding to see. So why view is still missing inside this view? Um, uh, in terms of doing data-driven uh, approach um, for, for robotics, uh, it's still, it's actually, I think a lot of bottleneck is still staying in learning the low-level skills, uh, which requires rich 3D geometry and, and contact reasonings. So what do I mean specifically for that? Um, so specifically, actually, we hope that we can, um, let me, so we do want the robot to um, to have skills that like human do. So what we want is, uh, for example, just going beyond pick and place, can we use our tools to uh, like daily life tools to, tools to do things. Um, so for example, you want to use grasping a hammer and then it's not just grasping about hammer, it's about also reorient it in the right direction and then use it to uh, do things. And then if you want to use a scissor, it's not just about grasping a scissor, right? So you also want to operate the scissor correctly um, to do a thing. Um, so to do that, you do actually a uh, very important skill, I think, is actually trying to um, do things in hand. Um, so oriented, reoriented things in hand, doing in hand reorientation uh, is actually the number one step we, we need to do uh, before using all the fancy tools we have in our lives. So beyond going beyond one hand, uh, we also uh, there is actually a very common skills that people do, um, like, like for a catch, baseballs and things. Um, so these kind of activities, uh, actually we see a lot in our daily life, but then uh, we never see actually a robot uh, throwing and catching objects uh, to our other robots. So um, the thing I want to show today is basically, um, the first thing we want to show today is basically try to uh, enable the robot to have this kind of skill. So one is basically you can um, manipulate objects in hands, and then the other is uh, you, when you have two hands, uh, we, we can do some for a catch. And how do we, um, so, so to do that, it's not just about um, overfitting to a single object. It's also about 
a single policy, a single strategy can uh, generalize to many different objects. Um, so how do we get this large scale data to train such a policy? Um, so that would be the key questions, uh, 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 central question. So the way out, the way we do it is basically we, we try to leverage the simulation data. So we just like uh, uh, we have a limit, unlimited data training RL and simulation, and then you do this kind of sim rule transfer in the end. But um, but if that is so easy, then why not everyone is doing it? Um, so actually, the sim rule transfer is really the key bottleneck. It's actually uh, a lot of robotics left we have. Uh, we'd rather do real robot learning, so track demonstration in real, and then um, also training in real. Um, that's what the RTX do as well. Uh, but then a lot less on sim to rule because it actually is extra difficult. So how to um, how do we do it? How do we make the designs to make this happen? Uh, is one of the key contribution in this side of research. Um, so besides just like doing it in the lab environment, we eventually want the robot to go around um, to clean up our kitchen, to go in our office, deliver coffees and stuff. Um, so we want it to be able to proceed the environment and walking in the world, uh, in, in the more complex environments. Um, so we, we would talk about it to be work that we did uh, with a small kitchen. I just learned that Dilish has this nice kitchen setup, a big kitchen setup. So I, 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 I like it a lot. Um, so in, in our side, we, we have a relatively big IKEA kitchens. If you have kids, you, you, you will know this is a standard IKEA baby kitchen. Um, and then we have a, a, a mobile robot now, uh, the big one, to, to do some mobile manipulation. So to do this kind of work, you actually need to have a good 3D perception. Um, so how do we, uh, the, the technique we're using here is basically we try to um, um, do generalizable nerves. So this is one thing I try to uh, try to also, uh, we, we spend a lot of efforts, like not just use nerve to, to do a static thing, but also make it generalizable and then adopt, adopt it to the, to the robots. Um, and then, uh, it's not just nerves. We also did Gaussians like everyone here do. Um, so I will, I will also talk about some something we did. I think it's quite excited um, on the vision side. Yeah, so that's that's kind of the uh, structure of the work uh, we, I will talk about today. Um, so I'm going to first talk about some of our manipulation work, uh, specifically on this uh, in-hand manipulation. Um, so it's actually a very strange things uh, for, for me to do it because it's the title is like rotating without seeing. Um, so from the vision guy perspective, I, I, I work on a project actually does not require vision. Um, so it's actually, you just imagine you have an object in your hand and you try to just manipulate and rotate your objects uh, by just feeling about the objects, not, not seeing it at all. So that's essentially what we try to enable the robot to do in here. Um, so, we use tech, touch sense, tactile touch sensing. Um, so there, are, of course, there's a lot of work in tactile sensing uh, back in the Ted Edison's work, and then um, some digit work that they finished is also part of the, the project in digit. Um, the thing about using gel site and visual tactile sensing is that uh, it's usually a very small piece, and then it's applied on parallel gripper. And then if you think about, you want to apply uh, touch sensors on your head, and it's only, if it is only in your fingertip, it's not actually covering uh, the most uh, part of the hand. So, so you're grasping something. If I grasp grasping like this, so my finger is not even touching the objects and the contact part is actually in the other side of uh, the other part of the hand. So you want to have a very dense contact with hands um, and, 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 and sense, sense that. So our inspiration is coming from this uh, graph. Um, I actually tried to recently reproduce things, but but no one knows how to do it now. I heard that um, it's it's only exists in the MIT museum. It's not um, it's not in, even in that lab anymore. Um, but but the idea is uh, is close to this one that we want to have the sensors uh, all over our hands. Um, so so as many as possible. So the thing we did is just uh, we have this Allegro hand, which is a standard thing. Uh, it's a, from a Korean company. And then we attach this kind of uh, uh, fault sensor on top, this fault resistance sensor. Um, so we attach basically 16 of them. So this is the real one. This is the simulated one. And then we basically, here is a zoom in look of this sensor. 
Um, so it's a very cheap sensor. If you search FSR sensor now in Amazon, it takes uh, maybe 10, 12 to 10 dollars each piece. Um, it only sends normal files, so how much pressure you apply on it. But the thing with it is actually even simpler. So what we did forward is actually oh, it's working now. Um, so 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 just binarize the signal basically is only about touching or not touching. So the reason why we try to simplify this, so here is a demonstration. So on the left is about um, you, you touch the hands with this sensor, um, and then you have, well, no, it doesn't work. Um, so, so you have these continuous signals as you're touching it, and this is just a binary signal as you're touching it. Um, so the reason why we try to binarize this thing is because it's much easier to do simulation using this simple sensor. So if you see what we train, this is we train a PPO in simulation, and then we basically have this like uh, we simulate this touch sensing in just one piece of like uh, 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 a square big piece things, and then if it is touching, it's basically green. If it is not touching, it's red. Um. So if it's just touch and not touch, in simulation, it's all about two geometry collide to each other lot. So it's more about geometry. So it's less about physics. So we train on tons of different objects, shapes. Um, and this basically migrated, like avoid a lot of um, tactile sensing simulation where you try to sense, uh, simulate deformable, how, how the soft material deforms inside simulators. That's very slow. And then it's also very, very hard to transfer the review. Um, um, so, so here is actually a zoom in thing uh, we have um, basically uh, you can see how different sensors activated in, in simulations uh, when we are trying to uh, train a PPO policy. And then the policy is quite simple. Um, that it is really, the learning is quite, quite easy. If I go back, if I can go back, um, oh, I can go back. Um, so so the, you just learn a few three layer MLP, and then you essentially take in the contact of uh, 16 dimension, where's the touch and not touch, uh, some previous actions of proprioceptions, and the output is basically uh, 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 position control of your each joint, um, 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 how, where each joint should move. Um, so that that is what we are trained on, and then we we have this goal to um, the, the goal is to rotate one object in one directions and emit as many angles as many circles as possible. So that's um, that's your how you define the reward function. So how large is your angle moving? Um, so that's the basically the task, and then we show that if you are applying, um, so there's basically there's a one curve on if you train on single objects. Um, the, the interesting we find that it doesn't make a big difference. Um, so so the red is without touch sensing, the, 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 the blue is with touch sensing. Uh, it doesn't make a big difference if you just train on open feet on single objects. Um, so you can just memorize what you do. For perception is enough. Um, but then if you train on multiple objects, that's why, why you, uh, what makes a big difference. So the suspect, uh, we basically suspect that you actually um, use the touch sensing to, to basically sense the geometry of the objects. Um, so you can differentiate different objects by touching it. Um, so kind of to validate this assumption, um, so one thing we did, um, so this is not about training the policy, the policy is already done. So what we, one thing we did is basically we try to after we train the policy, we give a shape, and then we just rotate the objects for one circle. And then we record the information of the touching information. And then we fit into a deep black word and try to do shape reconstruction. Um, so you can basically see that if you touch the objects, even with these many binary sensors, um, but you touch it more enough, you can actually kind of get um, the, the shape out of the uh, objects. Um, so that basically implicitly showing that this touch sensing, even though it's binary, but if you touch it a lot with a lot of binary sensor, it still gives you some information about the shape of the objects. So that that's a, just, just, just a visualization. We are not using it for any policy learning or anything. Uh, it's just after we train the network, we try to visualize it. Um, so we transfer it to real. Um, so we, we have some real objects in here. Um, uh, most of them are not in the training set, the shape, um, so here is a demonstration showing, uh, like try to zoom in uh, and showing we can close the light uh, and, and then still do it. We didn't recall of this a lot because we also have a common shared space. So if we do experiment close light, 
everyone stop working working. So so we only record one video in here. Um, um but but that's that's showing uh, on the top right you can show you can see the how each person is activated. Um so of course a, a question is how how do open loop works? Um so open loop means that you just keep rotating the objects without thinking about it, without feeling about it. Um, so, so it works in the beginning, but it stays. Um, so no tactile sensing is more about like uh, you have the proprioception, so you know where joint, of, where is each joint of your finger, and then, um, but you didn't have the tactile sensing. Um, so it works in the beginning, but it's, it's kind of easy to fall um, um, in the middle. Um, so a lot of failure cases is basically uh, falling. So, um, so we have the uh, two experiments to extend to uh, the, the test set. Um, so so this is like a, the most challenging is the rubber duck. We never see this curve duck in training, but we, we test it and then it still works out. And then we also rotate the objects uh, like the like the soft soft relative soft. So this is actually real food. Um, it's from whole food. Um, it's, uh, it's actually real tomato, not not just fake plastic tomato. Um, so, so kind of showing that it, it learns to um, not squeezing your tomato and, and still be able to rotate it. Um, so I think that is actually one perspective I like a lot that you train on a lot of data in generalized to a lot of unseen objects. Uh, that is more from the vision perspective because a lot of robotics work is training and testing on very similar things, um, but we, we, we try to explore more on the generalization side um, in this line of research. Um, and then we have uh, other access. So it's not just about rotating uh, the Z axis. You can also do this direction. Um, so just this Y axis. And then you can also do um, the X axis. So basically this, this direction. Um, so it's actually chain with different policies. Um, so one direction, one, one policy, you can think it that way. Um, so, so, so that's basically uh, this work. Um, so we recently do um, actually um, uh, incorporate vision. So we uh, talk about it without using vision, um, but it would be nice to, to see it as well. So we, we also have uh, incorporated point cloud sensing in here. Um, so we can now rotate more, not just convex objects because before it's more like a convex object. So now we can uh, rotate across, for example, and then we can rotate not only it's just uh, one ball, but also rotate um, two, two balls together. It's finding the timing to, to edit. Um, and then we, we also rotate to try to, let me, I will get this right. So this is tomato, and then this is the potato, and then uh, we can do tomato, potato together <laughs> um, um, at, at the same time. Um, so it's a little bit generalization. Uh, so it's a harder task, I will admit, and then there's similar size, um, but it's a different weight. Um, so, so you can do a little bit both together. Um, so we have the chocolate as well. We should always have that in the lab. And um, so, so, so this is. Um, so what we did, the approach is uh, is more like a steel engineering effort. Um, so we have the Kinect camera in here because it works relatively better when we do, do closer look. But I recommend maybe using um, iPhone might be better. Um, so, so the funny thing, uh, the interesting thing we do in here, you would think that how do we combine multimodal information, right? So we have touch sensing and we have point clouds. Um, how do we combine these two information together uh, for the policy to use? So the thing, we, uh, a very common thing to do would be like, oh, I just change a big transformer. Uh, everything is different tokens and then the transformer will produce it and do this and that. Um, but a little bit different thing in here we do is, um, we actually try to paint the point cloud using your tactile sensor. So essentially you can see some blue points on there, means that that is the point that it has not been touched. It has the sensor, but it has not been touched. And then there's a red point there, it has a sensor and it has been touched. So we try to uh, map your sensing into your visual observations. So we kind of fuse the two information this way. And then we just throw it to a point that and then um, and then go to the policy. Um, so I think this is a little bit novelty that we did here. How do we fuse the two information together? We just do a cute thing on, on, on uh, painting the point cloud. So, but then a very important message I have in here is also 
Um, I, I, I feel like uh, along a lot of projects, I feel like if you want to do sync to real vision, um, point cloud is one very uh, robust way to do it because like um, if you look at how your RGB, um, so your image in sim and your image in real, they, they are very far away. But if you look at the point clouds, it's actually quite um, quite transferable if you do point clouds. Um, learning similarly using point clouds. Um, so, so we are also have a couple of work in along this line research. We have DexCore in Coral, we have DexArt in, in Syria, try to try to sell this kind of idea that we, we can do point cloud in post learning, we can do point cloud RL um, in, in, and then it helps them to move to school. Right, so, um, so are there any questions at this point? Uh, I think this part is more about the the, the single hand uh, manipulation. Let me know if there are any questions, any any thoughts. Yes. Is it is that proprioception from the hand? Do you do you use that to store point cloud to point the point cloud to identify what is? Yeah, the exactly. So so basically, the proprioception tells you uh, uh in real time where the join join locate like with where your join location is and then you actually do have the model of your hand so you can the mesh model of your hand so you can actually reconstruct your hand in real time and then also render point out your hand there as well yeah. Yeah. Yes. have you tried backbones besides point net for learning with point clouds yeah um yeah actually we try like sparse convolution and all these um point net plus plus Somehow, still, point net works pretty robustly well. I mean, there's a lot of progress in doing point perception, 3D perception. But but uh, somehow, if you do, uh, especially uh, maybe in here is not the case, but especially in our previous work on, we try to learn reinforced learning together with point net. Uh, we find that still point net works best somehow. Um, and so maybe optimization is harder when you have a reinforcement learning objective. Um, but in here, we find like a nice, yes, yeah. yeah. Any any more questions? Yes. Do you need like a, a history context of your touch sensor readings? To... You do. Yeah, we have a uh, contact in three frames, uh, four frames, I think. It's very very early slides, but but it, we concatenate four times that. Um, actually. More does not help. That's the thing. We, we could do ten. It actually, hurts. Uh, it, it kind of uh, depends on your instance. Um, uh, uh, because like uh, still the tactile sensor is still very noisy. Basically, I think a lot of history actually occurs in in this case. Um, but but you need a little bit time for it. But more actually does not help. Yeah. Right. Any any more questions? Anything not clear? If not, I can move on. Um, so we we continue like uh, not not just doing one one hand. Uh, we we actually have works that basically um, work with two hands now. Um, so I borrow a lot of hands from my colleagues. I convince him to buy. I have a right hand, and then somehow convince him to buy a left hand. <laughs> um, uh, so so uh, we are doing this growing cat. This is a coral paper. It's also doing sim to real. I'm not going to zoom in too much detail on this work. But it's essentially kind of trying to convey this information that uh, you still can do a lot of things in Sim to Real, even though this kind of very dynamic motion of task. You have one hand throwing, the other hand is catching up the objects. Well, I have to admit that in this case, um, the object we use is actually kind of soft. Um, so we, we can generalize to a lot of objects, but it's, it's quite soft because uh, the rigid object is really bouncing um, a lot. Uh, it's very hard to have a rigid hand to catch a rigid object. Um, so, so in here is mostly sandbags or, or the soft objects, um, but, but you know, we show that we can learn these motions and then we have a camera tracking the object as it's growing and then we can catch it. Um, so, so that's, that's the, the thing. Another thing, try to tell you, uh, Synthurio has a lot of uh, 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 space to uh, improving robust skills. Um, so the next part is more vision. Uh, so, so maybe a lot more people will be interested in this part um, that we, we want to uh, generalize our robots in, in not just like this very constructed like environment, but also what we want it to work on the, like the realistic things. Um, so I will talk about two works in here. Um, so 
talked about in the beginning. Uh, so this is a coral work we did that we tried to do um, um, these kinds of more complex kitchen manipulations uh, based on language instruction. Um, although I would say language instruction is actually only five paths, so language is really more like an indicator uh, in here rather than just like language text to image kind of language. Um, but then still very hard task for robots. Um, so you want, again, you don't want it to overfit to environment, single environment. You want to generalize it to different kitchen and then in different uh, cluster, cluster settings. We have a lot of bars in here. Um, so how do we learn uh, like the generalizable policies? So the thing we do here is trying to tackle the perception part. Um, so how do we learn a generalizable 3D representation that has the both 3D information and also um, the semantics? So we go back to uh, the previous work I talked about. We have a lot of work that use this 2D portraying uh, foundation models to, to do uh, the things. Uh, we in the lab we also have some some work that we did a uh, very very good is open vocabulary instance segmentation work. Um, so so this works uh, kind of like me think like how do we also learn this kind of rich semantic feature in the a 3D space as well. Uh, so the things we try to leverage in here is actually a new radiance view. Um, so it's, it's a good tool to do beautiful, generate beautiful pictures. But the way I see it is that it's actually also just provide a good loss function to, to help you to get supervision from 2D to learn some representation in 3D. So that's the general thing mindset for me. Um, it's actually a good tool for learning representation uh, more than just like synthesizing beautiful pictures. So um, so the thing uh, we use is actually something we did in ICCV, uh, we call it feature learn. Um, it's essentially, I mean, in a lecture, I was training a pixel learn with feature distillation. Okay. Um, so if you work on this thing, you know what I mean. Um, so essentially you have an encoder uh, given an image and then you, you basically do your rendering, uh, learn rendering, but then you not only So where do I get the feature? Target view. So where do I get the feature? You can use the features, uh, you can use flip, flip feature, you can use dino feature. Um, the, the thing we did here is actually we use the stable diffusion unit feature because in the previous open work capital segmentation work we find the UNAP feature actually provides you a very good structural understanding of uh, properties. So we actually use stable diffusion feature here. Um, so we extract the 2D feature from, from the target view, and then we ask uh, from the source view, you not only need to render the pixel in target view, but also the features um, in the target view. And then the hope is that by doing this last fun two last function, we can learn the encoder that have both properties that understand 3D, and also uh, the students, the semantics from these two D models. Um, so, so this thing we just exactly uh, it's an IC three paper, but then we we move into the robotics domain, right? So we do the same thing, exactly the same thing, um, and then we do it in, in our robot scene. So we just like render pixels and also render the, the features. Um, so so doing doing this training and generalizable the pixel on it. Um, so oh. Um, so this is an animation, and then it is to a little bit um, um, emphasizing how how rendering works. Um, and you basically have this this guy here. Um, so it's like trying to do real synthesis but on the feature. Um, the the pixels looks very bad. Um, so so the reason is basically this all this is actually all doing one feet forward. So you don't optimize for um, for each. Uh, per static scene. Um, so the benefit of doing this is also if you have an encoder, you're actually encoding your information in real time. So if your table changes, your objects moving, it's all capturing that. It's not just like a static scene and then fix. So you have this encoder of the, the 3D scene, we take RGBD input, um, and then you basically have this uh, both features and 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 and, and, and pixel rendering, and then you use this. Um, these features to to put in the policy. The policy is another transformer. You break this 
features you have to 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 some tokens and the language you can go into the, the, the transformer. Um, so so this is the real scene. Uh, uh, to train this guy, we have three camera. One, two, three in here. That is in the training phase. Uh, in the testing phase, we only use this guy in the front camera. Um, so we have some uh, doing um, showing two, three, three tasks. Um, so this is kind of very still relatively simple task, but uh, turn it to into bit and works in the simple scene. And then also uh, we try to add some distractors around the objects and on, on the top is supposed to open the microwave in different directions as well. Um, and then we basically um, show, do some visualizations showing that the features um, basically have some attentions on the, on the, the bar of the microwave. And then in here is showing some, um, you want to move the teapot to, to the stove. Um, and then you have some visualization showing um, you, you have some attentions to this um, the bar you are trying to grasp. Um, so it's really just actually just extending our feature network in the robotics domain. Um, so so somehow you can get two papers that way. Uh, uh, but uh, is that I, I think it's the the the, the direct direction is really just like um, um, how to how to develop a better feature perception features uh, for robotics. I, I I feel like that's the like the direction I like a lot. Uh, we actually do a lot more work. Uh, we have the uh, model learn from ICML that we try to do learn training without camera, comap camera, uh, pre-process camera. And then we have this like uh, uh, TUF actually is like about, it's not relevant to robotics, so maybe relevant is given the 3D shape you do texture rendering. Um, it's also generalizable learn. <laughs> we have human as well. Uh, we try to train, train a human learn, but in a generalizable version. I'm basically trying to push along this direction that you, you, you will see it as a more training uh, like a representation rather than just like the rendering. Right, right uh, from the perspective, and and um, uh, so 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 this thing is basically manipulation. We recently buy this guy, uh, like not this guy, but this guy, um, <laughs> one of um So so it's a big robot. We try to do it man mobile manipulation with it. We install an app on it, um, so we can do uh, mobile manipulation. Um, so it's a sad story that we buy these five from the Cisco, and then they have B two. Uh, they will not exchange, but we just stick to it. Um, uh, so, so we did something with the uh, this guy. So it's actually still more a vision project. It's still doing the generalizable nerve. Now we are basically trying to use it for both navigations and manipulation at the same time. So you ask the robot to navigate, move to the table, and then grasp the things and then go go away. Um, so the thing I tried to sell in here is actually. It is a unified representation for both navigation and manipulation at the same time. So when you see far away, so you construct the whole map. So when you get, get to the close look at the objects, then you have the construction of, of the closer look of the geometry of the objects. Um, you are only able to do that by uh, doing it real time, doing it in a, with an encoder. Um, so, so this is a, a lot of demonstration showing that we can uh, the robot is walking, and then there's suddenly a, pe a pe human appears in, in front, and they try to uh, is able to understand these obstacles and navigate around it, and then uh, grasp the duck. Uh, so we like ducks a lot. Um, so no matter plastic or, or paper. Um, so so we we grasp this duck in be behind, and then um, that's so that's that's the thing. But but let's take a closer look of what's happening from. Um, from, from the vision perspective, right? So this is the front view camera. So that is the depth. Um, so that's what the robot see, right? So we, we did prepare a map. So we, there's no exploration problem in here. Um, no IR or anything. It's, it's more, more like a motion planning thing, but the focus is on vision. Okay, so you prepare the map, but then you you do, you could basically with this generalizable learn, you could just have real time update on the map. So you can actually, when you see something, you basically have the, uh, you can see the obstacle in front and then you can avoid it. You can update your map in real time. 
And then as you are uh, staring at your objects, so this is a red thing here because we we actually have disunion semantics in it, and then we query uh, the dark. So it has high response, but in that local region, and you you see more points coming in because it's actually getting more views um, as it is staring the objects, um, and that basically gives you more information, and then that helps you to um, do better grasping. Um, so, so the framework is similar that we we have this vision language model, but then we try to distill it into um, the three D space. Um, and here is another example. Of this guy uh, I show in the beginning. This guy go into this office, and then uh, he grasps um, he, he grasps the objects um, on on this table. It's not really um, So you can see the the locomotion is pretty NPC. So it's it's not. Uh, not motion locomotion where I did before. We, we just use the standard uh, default plan on that. Uh, the grasp grasping is also pretty lying, by the way. It's not RL. Um, but but this work is about uh, the representation. Again, so so you have this preview mat and you have this red thing there. Um, and so so we have high response on the on the thing that we want to grasp, and then you basically navigate to it, and then you um you have minutes and basically um I want to show the part that when you're getting close to it again because it's encoding real time you just have a few few things of richer and reaching more and more points you're getting more and more points um as you are staring at the objects so so that basically um it is I, I think it's quite useful to to make it uh be able to do to, to real time kind of uh, Perception. Um, so yeah, so so that's the um, that's that's this generalizable learn part. Are there any questions? Um, so to, to to about these two works. So it's all about training these 3D encoders, and then um, you're able to have some 3D and there's some some semantic information in it, so you can do manipulation or manipulation. Any 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 thoughts? Yes. So like you're doing, you're trying to pick up the dot here, like yeah. by combining like the uh, navigation and the right. and manipulation. Right. So like, what if the manipulation is actually giving you like a wrong stop decision? Yeah. So how do you correct that? Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> At this point, we didn't do it. Um, so I uh, said so to be honest, a little bit stage in here. Um, that like uh, like if the grasping fail, it doesn't. It doesn't have. It's not RL, so it's not. It doesn't have the regress thing in here. Um, so you just really just, uh, it's just a planner and then you see something and then you grasp it. Uh, we didn't plan for replanning, uh, regrasping. So, so um, and then you can see it's just, it's preferred to, to, right? So it's actually, you know, the exact location by, by this 3D thing. And then you have the same policy, basically just reach there, to there, grasp it. If it doesn't grasp, it doesn't grasp. Um, so, so, so the manipulation part is very light you think here. Um, we didn't do much extra. Yeah, we just buy it. We just, yeah. Okay. <laughs> How does that compare to playing over simpler representations? Like just the magically label point five or box and that Right. So I would, um, I would still think that um, you, I, I think in general, you just have um, um, interplays a little bit better. Oh, so so with this uh, using learn, so you have a little bit more smooth uh, representations um, out of it. Um, in general, perception for point clouds is actually quite noisy. Um, so it's very painful to to deal with that. In here, at least it's more clean and then more 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 interpolate a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so I guess that provides you the this advantage using learn to do that. Yeah. Um, yes. For the videos you showed where the point clouds are accumulating, yeah. the localization of the robot being provided by the robot face, or is your representation like telling you where you were in some global frame? Uh, it's actually the robot face. Uh, okay. The localization, we, 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 we do from the robot face. Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I... Yeah. Hi. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that uh, the previous work, like uh, the GM fact, uh, leveraged the uh, pre-trained semantic features from 
2D foundation models to distill uh, right. semantic information into right. deep 3D right. voxels, right? Right, right. Yes. Yeah. So I want to figure out that how sensitive or robust is about that kind of model's performance to the quality of the uh, pre-trained features. Like, uh, if the input is a uh, low low quality or a masked figure, how it will influence the recognition towards the scene. Um. So so for that that question, I essentially still. Uh, it's just extracting a latent representation. Um, so so basically, if you see um, this part, one second. So it's really, uh, you see this rendering results basically. I mean, it's able to reconstruct the pixel roughly and the features, you roughly this is PCA. Um, so you have this rough reconstruction it does not do very good reconstruction, to be honest. It's training on a lot of data. Um, so, but but turns out not very perfect reconstruction can still learn reasonable representation um, to, to, to operate. So I don't really know if you have more corrupted image into it and then uh, how will the representation be like. Um, but I will hope that if you train on a lot of data again, you have some sort of robustness, you can generalize. And then um, another thing is that I think is very interesting. If we we have basically you have multiple loss, you have behavior cloning, you have this reconstruction loss. Um, if you tune the behavior cloning loss at larger weight, it hurts the reconstruction. Um, so one part of the reason why it's not reconstruction well is actually because we have we are training the policy at the same time. Um, so I don't really know that from visualizing it whether a good representation should be reconstructing the image as well as at the same time. Um, so, so it's hard to say um, that whether um, you have a corrupted or less, less good structured image, what the representation will be. Um, it might be still able to get you representation for, for good action, but not good for your visualization. Um, so, so that's that's what we need. Some, 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 some experience we have. Does it answer your uh, question? Okay, I, I guess it can answer my question. Okay, right. Any, anything else? Um, we have maybe 10 minutes, but um, we, 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 we like this kind of uh, representation. I, I, th I talked to a few people, I promise we'll talk a little bit about this recent work because it's after CPR, so we should talk a little bit about uh, recent work we did, not just the old things. Um, so I'm very excited about these three really Gaussians. Um, so to work on LERP and then uh, now we have these things. Uh, so we have very interesting properties. So from now on, it's all about vision. There's no robots, unfortunately. Um, but but we have we can still have physics. So essentially, one first thing that we did um, is actually from uh, for this work, uh, we call feature splatting because we again do this kind of distillating of features into the um, into the Gaussian splatting. Um, but this work, we did a little bit more interesting thing. Um, we tried to, because with pretty Gaussian, you actually have the explicit uh, point simulation, uh, the po point um, explicit representation of the points of the rendering. So they yeah, actually, uh, I can help. Yes, okay. So you have this like, uh, sorry. I don't know why this happened, but but you have you can do rendering, and then the next thing I show is basically you can um also distill the feature. Um, so once you distill the feature, you can basically you, again like there do you can use your language to to localize uh this object. So this is the feature view to distill it on the points. So you can see some 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 small thing in here it looks like points. So this is your your function um with the feature. So once you have these things, you can localize your objects, and you can also get your localized three D points to put in a physical simulator. Um, so this is our other thing. So I try to, I want to move this file forward. I read, read, I just showed sort of something under the view. Sorry about that. Um, so so we can basically do this kind of thing. Um, you can put your points inside your simulator, 
And then you say those points are liquid or sand, and then you can just mount it. Um, so here is the thing. Um, so I say, okay, this is the um, these points are liquid, and then I can just make it, make the yeah. orange juice out of the orange <laughs> uh, like this. Um, and we can basically, I think the next example is not very good, but um, yeah. So so we remove the chair. Um, the chair got removed, and the ball goes up. Uh, but but the it should bounce back, but the this does not do well. Um, we're still doing more more things on here. Um, and then there's this uh, blanket. Um, so you can basically simulate it into cloth material, and then we um you can go down. Um, so so I think the the good thing about this explicit, I'm excited about this explicit kind of representation is that uh, it connects directly to the physical simulator. Um, and then it has. A lot of more things we can do um, from here to to the lines. Um, and then we have the um, what's this? Oh, so this is the comment three. Um, so we basically doing trying to do um, like uh, we don't want you to pre-compute camera poses when you're doing this version pretty cautious planning. Um, so this work is about just not running combat but still able to do this thing. Um, so we have some results. Um, so the state of art before that is the no nerve. If some of you worked on this, they just that's like also without comat, but you you do it from nerve. Um, so I'm not sure if it's showing it good here. We let's try to appreciate the quality of the picture uh, as we always do for nerve. Um, but but in general, we have a much better rendering results compared to the nerve without camera kind of work. Um, before that is bar, bar, there's a nerve minus minus in this line of work. Um, and um, so here is another examples showing that um, um, this also same nerve without uh, camera uh, kind of work. And then here is the, the example in the beginning. Uh, we can have much better better rendering. And I want to show where it was failing for the for this approach before. Um, so essentially. Uh, we are doing camera post estimation together with reconstruction. Um, so, so the the the, the blue line is basically what you do with the the coma. Um, and then uh, the the red line is produced by a different approach with the baseline, the low nerve, and our approach. We find that um, so the previous work works pretty how did, well. How do you compute the ground? So it's coma, coma. Form of is ground. Yeah, yeah. But what is that? <laughs> So so that is uh so this is from the low nerve to the other one is the low nerve and, and ours is the uh, is from our uh, approach. Um yeah, sorry, bunch of this comment. I know uh, but it's comment. Uh, okay, I should just say comment. Um but uh essentially uh some previous work when you train learn without comment is basically uh it works well for normal like front view kind of data, doesn't work quite well if, if the camera motion change. Largely, uh, like this co 3 data, uh, we still keep, be able to keep tracking this. So, uh, the approach I would simply uh, introduce approach. So the approach is really about utilizing the continuity continuity of the video. So, so the things we do in here is that when we are trying to construct the three D Gaussians of the scenes. Um, so imagining we are taking a video, so continuous view uh, observation of the videos as input of a static scene. Uh, we try to uh, progressively, gradually uh, grow in the 3D Gaussians. Uh, it's not, not, not optimizing everything at the same time, but just progressively growing the 3D Gaussians. Um, to do that, we need to do something in local first. So very, for very close, nearby two frames, we construct a local 3D Gaussian. So, so for this one, we just use a monocular depth estimation. So we have the point out from here, from here, uh, but the point from here, we can do the we can get your Gaussians for this particular frame, and then you want to do some like global transformation for these Gaussians so that it becomes another set of Gaussians so that you can render the view of your uh, of of this uh, the next time set. So the thing about this is that this is not a very hard task because. These two frames are super close. They're very, very close. Okay. And then we are doing for the metronomes, 
and then do backdrop to 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 basically get these uh, camera pose. You will think it's actually very hard, but the explicit point representation from Gaussian actually makes it easier. So so essentially, it becomes you apply a transformation on your point. You rotate the point a little bit. You cannot do that with nerve because nerve you you cannot rotate the nerve. Um, you can change your rate and, and whatever um, way to, to, to actually do the camera pose. Um, but in here, you can actually rotate your representation. And that makes uh, the bad prop to get the pose much easier. Um, so these two things, one is they're super close. The second is it's explicit 3D, so you can actually uh, like, like do the rotation on the explicit 3D. So we get these two close um, um, uh, 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 pose, local pose, and then by getting this pose, um, we can just add a lot of frame into it. Um, so we can grow it a little bit, and then we have a lot of frames. We add still a pose after having it. We can also continue grow it, grow it, grow it. Um, so, so essentially, we we basically uh, continuous progressively uh, grow your free form free decoctions um, in this way. So that's how we do it. So, so the trajectory is also just like uh, computing each relative camera uh, at each at each time set. Um, so, so that's that's basically um, this 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 thing. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Uh, yes, uh, I have several questions. Yeah. Um, uh, like for, for this work. Okay. Uh, have you show any? Like one co map fail, or yeah. like for there's texture list, or you have hard to find correspondence to solve the pose because that's yeah. the, the really useful case. Yes. Uh, there's a good question. Um, uh, we struggle a little bit on, like, I don't think at this point um, we reach the levels of we are able to fix when co map fail. Uh, we actually try to do that. Uh, we do a lot of experiments on that. We try to find videos where Comac fail, we, we, we fail at the same time. We fail at the same time. So, um, um, yeah, so explicitly, uh, yeah, so so this is something, yeah, we we, we are not reaching there, there yet. But um, it's, uh, we still think it's nice to have this um, because it shows some nice pro 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 property in Gaussian. So you can do these kinds of uh, bad prop to estimate camera more easily. Maybe this can be you know, like 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 um we actually the version one of this work is plugging this into bundle adjustment to to do things. Um we just find it maybe it just become combat. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so uh, uh <laughs> so maybe don't, don't do it and uh, do it more like that. Yeah, um so so that's that concern as well. Um so so I mean definitely these properties can be a good integration into combat. Um I think. There's no doubt, um, but then can it be going beyond that framework? Um, yeah, yes. yes. Are, are you bottlenecked at this moment by the quality of monocular depth, do you think? Or yes. do you think are you bottlenecked by global adjustment? Um, I think it's uh, uh, bottlenecked by the global adjustment. I think that is, is pretty okay. Uh -huh. um, the global adjustment is, is something we are. I mean, it's also when, when combat fail is also the case when you um. Um, in here is actually when you the motion moves very large, very fast. Um, so your linear vibrations are not that near, then it makes this part there, and then makes this part there. Mm -hmm. Um, so so that's that's the challenge. Yeah. And uh, a following up question uh, is the molecular depth is used for the first frame, or you have to every frame, every frame, every frame, every frame, every frame then, you have a new molecular the, depth. The question is, there is a problem called like consistent. That's okay. Uh, yes. that's, that's okay. <laughs> Because you only do it from this part. And then after you estimate the camera, and then you you do your global optimization in here. So you, in here you don't use this part. Uh, so see. so so basically you know the camera and you know everyone's camera, and then you do your optimization here. You don't rely on the monocular lab estimation anymore in for that. Yeah. This part is only for um for, for computing the local. Oh, camera, camera. Another question about the previous, uh, like the feature okay. splitting is, yeah. uh, so you are like using the features to shade, to do the shading uh, instead of RGB, right? No, 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 it's, it's RGB. It's, it's, I don't know, I mean, the features in the 3D. Feature is actually really just used for localizing the object. Um, 
and then that's point three zero for test. So there is no like feature since no no feature is not for any renderings. Uh, rendering is the same. It's just showing you how I can get the point and then put it in the simulator and then render. It. So it's just so, used to localize. Yeah, point. it's only used to localize. I see. It's, yeah, it's not for anything else. Uh, I mean, I, I have a problem with the title as well. So we're actually emphasizing too much on feature because it's actually the business part has nothing to do with feature. Um, so we are still debating, although it's already something to do. But, uh, 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 so, so last thing, uh, I'm over time, uh, but, but uh, we also do mesh. Um, so we're able to uh, do this guy. Um, so we actually have this video. Uh, so we try to do this kind of mesh reconstruction from video. Um, it's not really the input. I mean, all of you work from Valley Miller knows that it's actually different time step, yeah, different view. So that is not the real input uh, to, to, to uh, this, this disclaimer. But but uh, we, we are following the, the wrong setting, I would say. Uh, but um, but we are we are able to uh, doing more like this kind of this is our output. So it's you get you a, a temporal consistent uh, mesh reconstructed uh, compared to uh, yeah, putting the light would be better. A student tell me black background is better. Uh, so so sorry for changing to black background. But uh, uh, if you compare to uh, all these like the uh, forty uh, like like the, the multiple different planes and and, and learn, um, it, it gets much better results. Uh, we can do BERT. Um, I mean from the CMR and then now 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 you can see how BERT progressing over time. Um, so our bird is pretty well, the wings are pretty nice, they were constructed. Um, and then um, again, it's pretty cons uh, temporal consistent, so you can actually have correspondence um, uh, like uh, uh, um, on, on, on these different vertices on the, the mesh. Uh, I would like to draw the correspondence out, but we only were able to do it. So this is uh, a synthetic video. Uh, uh, a synthetic video, yeah, yeah. We we down we buy some assets to do it, basically. Um, so to uh, uh, but but it's synthetic multiple videos actually. Um, so so we're showing, uh, but uh, showing is capable of doing pretty good reconstruction, um, uh, like uh, like uh, a temporal consistent. So you have the wings that we butterfly. Do you uh, do you uh sorry have, have a what kind of light should she use for that video? What kind of what is it? I mean, is it like Lambertian illumination or? Uh, I think it's just like a rendering. Um, I don't think we tune any of that. Um, I actually don't know. Uh, we just use Blender. We have the Blender file, and then we um have the uh kind of um uh, in each time we just render from actually different um views. Um, yeah, so, yeah, but uh. Yeah. uh I mean, depending on the, uh, if you would have a reflective function, like even in the Arabian speed, yeah. uh, would it change with Cetaphy or would it be the same? Change from what? Would it change with the direction with Cetaphy, like in the in the maps uh, uh -huh. terminology, or would it remain the same? Uh, I think it's remaining the same. Um, yeah. Um, um, so, so, um, yeah, I think it's it's remaining the same. The light source is remaining the same. Yes. Um. So so I I try to do as close to realistic. I mean, in the paper we also do analysis on um, uh, remaining the same and also your camera is continuous. So it's not the uh, so right now it's not continuous. I mean, this video is fake again. Um. So this is not what we use for input. Um. Showing what uh, but the actual input is multiple views. But we do have an input that we. Have a continuous camera with fixed light source but continuous camera doing this way. The reconstruction is actually much worse up there. Um, so here, uh, these are the multiple views, but, but with better results. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, right. So, uh, you can do editing. So basically, if you have this like um, a mesh in here, and then you basically have um, you because you have the mesh, you have the correspondence. And, yes, and then you basically can paint your, your first frame and then you can transfer to uh, to, to our following frames. Yeah. Um, oh, so, so this is like, uh, it's more like a, um, showing if you have a mesh representation, it helps. Um, so, so this sort of editing um, with some application. All right, so the pipeline, uh, 
I, I don't think I have time, but the paradigm is quite simple. Um, so it's uh, it's actually doing whatever dynamic uh, deformable nerve, uh, uh, deformable Gaussian spreading is doing. Um, and then stage one is exactly the same. Uh, but uh, we add another stage. Basically, you have um, um, you have the Gaussians here, and then you have this uh, converted to the grid, and then we use something called DM tag to basically convert it into mesh. So the canonical canonical points is coming to mesh, and then we change additional deformation network to uh, deform the mesh to other views and then render it. Um, so this part is actually differentiable. You can pop back from this part. It's all differentiable you can back up everywhere. But um, uh, we did try to train both together, right? So you can back up all the way. Um, that doesn't work well. What so, are the SFM points? Um, what which points? SFM points. Uh, so this is more like um, um, so you still need to uh, so, so from the, from from the single fields uh, we we kind of still do SFM to to get the that basically um, to 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 get this so that from this but this is part, non this is non rigid SFM, right? this non SFM yeah 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 but but you uh, you essentially just learn from um, so, so this pretty Gaussian is basically uh, is the dynamic Gaussian is always like uh, you have a you, you kind of learn a canon canonical and the canonical is essentially in the first frame uh, the canonical Gaussian and then you learn a deformation function on top of this canonical um, representation. So, um, so essentially, uh, th this is going to be deformed um, to 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 fit into different concepts. Yeah. Okay. Any, any, any more? Uh, I have a short yeah. question about the mesh. Yeah. Because now it's still like some opening in the area, like from how to extract the mesh from a Gaussian. Yeah. Have you any observed any like artifact when you zoom in? There are like ellipsoids, uh, overlapping or like ellipsoids artifacts. On yeah. The uh, there is. Um. So if you look at the um. um uh, yeah. Like there, there is this. Um, okay, I don't know. Okay, so uh, if you look at the horse, it's actually still um, not very good because, like, uh, you focus on this this part. Um, so so it's actually it's not really like uh, um. So it's sometimes the limbs is squeeze a little bit. Um, so so. I'm not sure if it's sort of and I guess you get yeah, yeah. like better, really better result because you also have an optimization in the second stage. Yeah, like directly optimize the, the mesh on the mesh. Yeah. That's maybe help a lot. Yeah, um, it's because it's always need to deform the canonical mesh. Um, so from the canonical, um, right. Um, yeah, right. Um, yeah, so that summarized everything. Um, so, oh, I mentioned that because I'm trying to start. Um, so, we, we do a lot of work in Cinturil. Uh, Cinturil could have been large data, but not just real, but also Cinturil. Uh, we do a lot of perception that we, we hope that we can generalize robots. It can be precautions, it can be guilt. Um, so, so, that's that's basically concluding the next step. Thank you all the time. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, we can take one question. If there's a question in the audience. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So you had uh, applied uh, in your previous work uh, the cycle from sequence series. Right. It's really like a very universal principle. Yes. Uh, I mean, in particularly with respect to temporal sequence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how would you, I mean, uh, uh, what principle did you apply here for temporal study? Um, I think. Um, Is it correspondence? Is I think it's like more like continu continuity. I would think like um, um, the, the, the I think the, the principle I will keep thinking even for cycle consistency is about this continuous changing progressively slowly. Changing and that give you um, the opportunity to compute relative poles much easier 
and then progressively growing, you'll see. I mean, even for for example, actually cycles still be, can be can applied in here. The, it, the, it, the it, power, it, the power yeah. of cycle uh, of yeah. cycle consistency, it was that uh, it was beyond the uh -huh. C one continuity that uh, it was not it just is. locked. Yes. Yes, right. but it's also from the continuity. Uh, when you only have it's continuity, much more than right? Uh, but in the temporal domain, it's, it's when you first have continuity, then you have the, the cycle. Otherwise, it just disappears. It doesn't uh, cycle back. Um, so you still need to have the continuity in, in, in there. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, underlying sharing geometry for continuity. Same sharing for continuity. Yeah. All right. Cool. Let's thank the speaker. Yeah. Right